You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 226. On today's show, we talk about giant hand axes, an Iron Age cremation, and prehistoric camel enamel. Let's dig a little deeper into that canamel. <laughs> Welcome to the Archaeology Show. Hello. We're here in Pacific City, Oregon, yes. where it's was a high of 66 today, which is kind of a heat wave for us this yeah, week. Yeah, it is chilly here. And like, it's not sunny either. So no. I'm in long sleeves and I'm kind of happy about it. Oh, and I'm drinking tea. I feel very cozy. I'm very All sorry right. to everybody else in the country well, right we've now. we <laughs> climatologically canceled right now. So know, right? yeah, it's uh, <laughs> for anybody not in the United States, it is a baking heat wave, breaking yeah. records all over the place. Like mm-hmm. I think Phoenix had over the whole weekend, they were sort of lows in the mid 90s. Oh, it's so bad. Yeah. Like they, I think they had a, a streak of hitting 110, like many, many days in a row, or something like that. Yeah. Just absolute ridiculousness. Yeah, the 90s is but, uh, about 32 Celsius. By the way, that's 90 degrees. Yeah, but so. you know what? We live in an RV for a reason. We chase this weather. I'm we you. planned this. We did this on purpose because we did not want to be anywhere it might possibly be hot. So I know this you worked d- out. <laughs> you don't agree with me on this, but a lot of people are like chasing 70. You know? Yeah. Chasing like 62. No, 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 no. 58 we're, maybe? We're definitely chasing like maybe 68. I'll give you 68, but probably 70, 75. But don't you like using like our heated floors and our fireplace? I do, but I also love the sunshine uh, and gross. like nice days outside. Like we went wine tasting yesterday and even though it was in the... 90s, probably 90s, it was, 90s, which was only an hour from here, which is crazy. Like yeah. the Oregon coast is crazy how cold it is. Just going across the mountains, yep. you get into the rest of the heat wave that the country is experiencing. But yeah, you go over the coastal range and it gets nuts. Yeah, yeah. so like a 20 degree swing, it's crazy. But anyway, yeah, yeah. it's been lovely to be here and yeah. avoid the heat. Really big temperature differences. Yes. So you know what else is really oh, big? Oh, there it is. I was like, <laughs> wait, we already said that. Why are you saying that again? Giant uh, hand axes. Giant hand axes. Which, to be fair, I didn't even know were a thing. Like, I've heard of a lot of hand axes in my life, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll, we'll talk about hand axes later, but yeah. the uh, giant hand axes are something that I didn't know was a category of hand axe. Right. right? I did not know that either. Yeah. That was new so, information. All right. Well, let's get into this. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is another great article from Smithsonian Magazine, although mm-hmm. they, as they usually do, link to the actual journal article, mm-hmm. which is in our show notes. Yeah, they're always so good about doing that. Yeah. I love I love their content. So over 800 prehistoric artifacts have been excavated in Kent, England. Two of them are being called giant hand axes, um, and this is and and researchers believe that they're over 300,000 years old. So very old giant hand axes. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And just a note for our YouTube viewers, this is completely unedited. I simply don't have the time for it right now. So all of our mistakes, all of our little things, that's just for you guys. Sorry mm-hmm. about that. If we yep. ever get to the point where we're making any money doing this, then, you know, we'll have somebody edit these videos. I don't know. It's like more real like this, right? Come anyway. come for the real version. Yeah. Sometimes we yell at each other. Like that might happen and it'll probably stay in. It might. <laughs> all right. So that was just for you guys. Mm-hmm. Back to the podcast. This project is actually being done as a CRM project, which yeah. I really like. They mm-hmm. they do, I mean, I would say a lot of archaeology happens in England as a result of CRM, only because it's a, I mean, it's a rel- relatively densely populated island, I'm mm-hmm. going to call it that. Yeah. <laughs> Landmass. <laughs> it's an island, for sure. Yeah. But it's densely populated mm-hmm. with both people and also sites yeah because it's been populated for so well, long so there's so much to find there and this is why anytime you want to like build something they're laws take over and you have to do a, a cultural resource yeah. assessment so, yeah definitely yeah they're building a new maritime academy apparently uh, okay. near kent um kent is i think a county well it might also be a name of a town i, I didn't actually look that up too. yeah yeah well the maritime county the maritime academy i didn't actually remember where this was but it's mm-hmm. in somewhere else uh, they didn't say Kent. There's another town that it's mm, actually in. Okay. So yep. anyway, the that's why they're doing this. Mm-hmm. So big archaeology, CRM archaeology project. Again, the artifacts are thought to be date to between. Um, so the artifacts are actually thought to date date to an interglacial period between 300,000 and 330,000 years ago. Okay. Now let me put that into context for people that might not know what the hell I'm talking about. Interglacial. 
But I thought the Ice Age ended, you know, 15 to 20,000 years ago. Right. It did. But there's been lots of Ice Ages. Yeah, over and over again. I mean, every 25, 30, 40,000 years, there's an Ice Age, mm -hmm. you know, and there's... Look up Milankovitch cycles. It's it's the whole thing where the Earth bobs up and down um, in the solar system, and mm -hmm. the solar system actually bobs up and down in the uh, galaxy mm -hmm. as it spins around the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes twenty six thousand years or something like that for the for the solar system to rotate around the galaxy. Yep. And it people think that that might be what's causing some of these slight climatic variations that cause ice ages. So mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not really a scientist on that kind of stuff. I have heard some things about that, but that's one of the reasons. So there have yeah. been lots of ice ages that our human ancestors have had to live through. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is just in between two of the ice ages that yeah. happened, you know, we're, back then. We're in an interglacial right now. D yeah, but sure. I mean, we're not an ice age it, by any means. I don't know that it's going to go back towards an ice age anytime soon. Oh, but... <laughs> well, there have been heat waves too. Like, yeah, there have been that's true. very yeah. warm periods of the earth. Now, of mm -hmm. course, uh, this isn't a climate talk, but of course, yeah. one of the big differences right now that might make you correct is that we have rapidly accelerated the heating of the earth over the last couple hundred right, years. Right. So we don't really know what kind of an effect that's going to have long term. Yeah. Yeah. It might not swing back. It if might we, not. If we make yeah. it go too high. Mm -hmm. Look at Venus. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there were certainly Neanderthals living there at the time, but there could have been other archaic human species around okay. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like according to the University College London researchers are the ones who did this uh, actual excavation. Yeah, because we do have some overlap between, you know, Homo sapiens, archaic Homo sapiens, yeah. basically, and then Neanderthals. And were Denisovans in this area as well? I know time frame wise they overlap. I don't know if they geographically overlap here, I don't though. Think geographically, they not made geographically. It out that far. Okay. Yeah. So but there could be, uh, was it Homo antecessor or Homo erectus? Oh, sure. Okay. Could have been, I mean, 300,000 years ago. Yeah. You know, you're getting back into the time frame where there's a lot of overlap. So a lot of overlap, yeah. Maybe we should go back and listen to our paleo project. I know. So, I'm like yeah. already forgetting, but, but there's so many different ones to remember yeah. and they branch in so many different directions. So. Well, and of course, we were talking in general terms on that series. Yeah. And this is like what happened in England. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Totally. And, yeah. and during an ice age, England wasn't an island. Right. You know, the, the water sucks out of the English Channel and ends up in glaciers mm -hmm. and at the poles. And you can walk from France to England mm -hmm. and, and probably in some other areas, too. But I know for a fact you can walk from France to England. Yep. So anyway, uh, they like I said, they said, you know, there's uh, Neanderthals and possibly other archaic human species. They know mm -hmm. there's Neanderthals in the area, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no fossil remains of any uh, hominid or, you know, bones or anything like that of uh, hominid remains and at the site at a site this old really the only thing you could hope for is fossilized remains to give you an yeah. idea of what group of of humans or human type yeah. people <laughs> created these hand axes yeah and check out the sketchfab video i'm totally calling it a video because it has like a play button mm -hmm. but it really is a sketchfab is a 3d modeling it's website really cool. where you can drop in 3d models and then share them out and that's mm -hmm. what they've done as an embeddable 3d model and when you click on it you can actually uh it'll load the model and then you can actually rotate around the hand axis yeah. zoom in and out it's it's a really well done it's really cool um, yeah it's pretty cool it's, and it's such it's so amazing what they can do with the technology these days because you feel like you're really looking at it when you look at that model it's it's yeah. really cool yeah like in person you really you're really looking at it in person yeah it, it's yeah. really neat yeah so hand axe is a tool that was used across Europe for several hundred thousand years and, mm -hmm. and actually a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. The giant hand axe is, you know, something that's a little bit later, but um, in the but the hand axes themselves generally, as they're called, I mean, they go back well over a million years. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll mention that a little bit later. Um, so it is it sounds um, it's just what it sounds like as far as what that means. It's a, an axe that you hold in your hand. It's got a teardrop shape. Mm -hmm. um, it's been shaped to a point and you're intended to grab it with your hands and swing down in like a like a chopping motion. Yeah. Right? So like the, the wider end, that's sort of the, the bulbous end of the teardrop. Yeah. You would grab that end and then you can like stabby, 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 <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The giant yeah. hand axes apparently are more than 22 centimeters long, which mm -hmm. is 8.7 inches. Mm -hmm. So 22 centimeters, you can tell that. It's not an even eight. It's not an even inch, which mm -hmm. means this whole thing came up in Europe, of course, because we don't have hand axes over right, here in the right. United States. Yeah. Um, we have probably some relatively similar things as far yeah. as chopping tools and things like that goes. Mm -hmm. But we don't actually have hand axes right. in the in the way that they do in Europe and Asia, actually. So 22 centimeters long. Now, one of the ones discovered at this site, there was only three of the 800 artifacts uh, were giant hand axes. Okay. 
there were probably other hand axes, but they didn't they mention that. They weren't giant. They weren't giant. Right. Yeah. So, um, but one of the ones discovered was 29.6 centimeters or 11.7 inches long. Oh, wow. So, so like almost a foot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And a full three inches longer than like what makes it a giant mm -hmm. hand axe. So it's actually the third largest one found in Britain, hmm. which is pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah, no one can really figure out or has any good ideas on why you would make a hand axe that big. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, yeah, I imagine that something that big is like, like you, how do you use it? You, it's mm -hmm. too big. It's too big to hold in your hand. It's unwieldy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have any control over what you're doing with it, and that kind of takes away the point of using a tool if mm -hmm. you don't have any control of what you're doing. So. Yeah, but, weird. But what do you think the UCL team thinks it could have been used for? Um, well, I'm drinking tea, so I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> Ritual! <laughs> yep, coffee. Um, <laughs> so they said symbolic functions. They didn't yeah. actually say the word ritual, mm -hmm. um, but I put that in there. Yeah. Symbolic functions is really just kind of a word for ritual. Fancy word for ritual, for but sure. <laughs> kind of. They also said, as far as uh, symbology goes, mm -hmm. like um, they could have been used for it as a demonstration of strength and skill. Oh. Like, look at the big hand axe I made. It's yeah. bigger than yours, therefore I'm the king. Kind of like how Highlanders throw like tree trunks and stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Like, it doesn't really serve a purpose except to show like how strong you are or yeah. how amazing you are yeah right. yeah <laughs> and, and as i said before they don't know if it's neanderthals or another species of archaic humans that made them but neanderthals we know have existed in europe and asia from around four hundred thousand years ago give or take to mm -hmm. about forty thousand mm -hmm. years ago um, when they were basically replaced by modern homo sapiens right thousands of neanderthal hand axes hand axes have been found in the region where the current ones were found, not just like in Britain, just like where the current ones were found. Right. Like, like thousands. Like, like very everywhere. specific to that region. Yeah. So we know that they were making them there and using them there. Yeah. 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 And Neanderthals, of course, <sighs> you know, it's still sort of yep. a slang word for you're an idiot. I know. But, <laughs> we're, we're working so hard to change that perception because yeah. Neanderthals are so much more than the popular culture would have you think they were. I know. But, they're portrayed as like dumb cave people. Yeah. And now we're seeing you know, through repeated evidence through time mm -hmm. that they conducted rituals, even buried their dead in mm -hmm. some cases, made art, art yeah. yeah, developed complex tools and, uh, and more, uh, and more advanced things yeah. um, that history has given them credit for. Yeah. So. Neanderthals are my favorite, like, like sideline species, right? <laughs> like they, they've always been pushed over in a way. Oh, they're not part of humans. Oh, they weren't as good at doing things as our human ancestors were. They were just these guys over here that lived for a little while in caves and now they're gone. But like they contributed genetic material to Homo yeah. sapiens probably or definitely. And yeah, they they had so much more going on than than science originally wanted to give them credit mm -hmm. for. So the transit, the evolution of our ideas of what they were is, is right. great. Now, Neanderthals, just going to their, their advanced credit, mm -hmm. they actually invented what's called the Lavoie technique. Okay. And Lavoie is a, I think it was a neighborhood in Paris or something like that where mm -hmm. the first one of these was found. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was named after. Um, but that was around 300,000 years ago. And it's basically, it's this whole thing. It's the process of shaping a stone into a portable core that they could later shape into sharp stone tools. Right. So what does that mean? Um and well, first off, the Lavois flake, what it looked like was a nice, thin, predictably shaped tool that demonstrated that they had the ability for mm -hmm. abstract thought, which means they could look at this rock, know what they were trying to make, mm -hmm. and then make that thing. And this was kind of like creating something to to turn into something later on, depending on what they needed it to do, right? Sort of, yeah. Um, because they could make the core, actually, the core. Yeah. They'd take flakes out and then just take that with them. Yeah, and, and then, then finish it up later based on yeah. what they needed. But they could get lots of things off this core if it was big enough. Oh, so, like take a big flake off of it and then use that to do something. Well, that's the lava wall flake, uh, right? Okay. So they would yeah, take this yeah. core and they would start flaking around the edges of it. They'd make a striking platform mm -hmm. on top, like a flat platform. Mm -hmm. And then they would... Uh, you know, basically flake it with rough percussion flaking mm -hmm. ar around the edges. And it was called like the turtle dome. Um, that's what archaeologists call it. Because oh, yeah. it kind of looks like a turtle shell. Yeah. And then when they're ready, you know, when they're, when they're ready to do this, they basically just hit the striking platform in a certain way with a certain strength. And it just busts off this uh, flake that has this um, distinctive what they call plano convex profile. Okay. Where it's just kind of a kind of a, a little bit of a, a arc to it and it's totally flaked on one side oh. not flaked on the other side because it is a big flake uh -huh. and then they just uh, spend a little bit of time sharpening up the edges and, and doing whatever they're going to do to it whatever they're going to make out of it cool and that's the lava wall flake mm -hmm. yeah cool it gave them better control over 
the final size of the flake and, and mm -hmm. how many they could make. Yeah. You know, because like I said, a single core, depending on the size of it, you could probably get a few of those off of there. Right, right. Yeah, because you take them around the edges. Mm -hmm. You might even be able to make something out of that core by the time you're done. So mm -hmm. um, that technique largely replaced the Achillean technology that lasted for over 1.5 million years and produce smaller oval and pear-shaped hand axes. So like I said, the hand axe has been around for mm -hmm. a long time, well yeah. over a million years. The Lavawa technique tended to kind of replace that. And then they were making, you know, apparently giant hand axes eventually too. Yeah. So the giant hand axe seems to be more in the Achillean tradition as opposed to the Lavawa. Yeah, probably. They're not really related. From yeah. What I can tell, although yeah. you could probably make a, a hand axe out of well, a lava waff like if it's big enough. Oh, sure. And there's so much crossover between these populations. There's yeah. no reason to think that Neanderthals weren't doing this Ashleyan thing and, and vice versa. So, yeah. yeah, for sure. But that is really interesting because it is sort of maybe evidence that it was from a Homo sapien group rather right. than a Neanderthal group. I guess that's probably why they said that in the beginning, that it could be an archaic yeah. human group too. So, But the more interesting thing to me is is why. Like, yeah. why? Could it have been some kind of competition or game where they were like, who right. can make the biggest hand axe, <laughs> you know, even though they never were going to use it? Well, I mean, it's crazy. like they said, it could have been some sort of symbolic nature like yeah. that. Yeah. Like, like I said, I made the biggest one. Uh, I could basically stab you in the skull with this. Therefore, I'm mm -hmm. the king and, and I'm going to rule you now. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah. Well, we can also quickly dispel one thing that you might or might not have heard at some point on Ancient Aliens. It's not for giants. We know that. Are you sure? Redhead, <laughs> redheaded giants? <laughs> yeah. I, I feel very strongly that it's not for giants. But as a scientist, I'll keep an open mind. But my mind is not that open to it right <laughs> i need a lot more evidence to become really open to that right so yeah well it just goes to show that the neanderthals were pretty advanced more advanced yes. than we give them credit for yeah and like i said they did burials but they didn't necessarily do cremations that took a little while later to happen and we'll uh -huh. talk about that on the other side of the break welcome back to the archaeology show episode 226 segment two and now we're going to talk about early Iron Age cremation burial that contains bronze jewelry and rare textile fragments found in Austria. Yes. And this article is one that I found. I got very excited about it because of the textile piece, because I love fabric. <laughs> <laughs> I love making fabric and sewing fabric and knitting and all things fabric related. In fact, I have a Google search for textile and archaeology together, which is how this article you know, popped up for me. And see, to me, saying I love fabric is like saying I love banana peels. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? I don't know exactly, right? <laughs> you make no sense. <laughs> oh, man. No, but the history of textiles and clothing and the way that people use anything that you could make with a textile is just so interesting to me. So, yeah. And this is just another aspect of it, but it's a pretty old one. So, the Vienna National History. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Okay. The Vienna National History Museum has found a cremation burial with bronze jewelry and textile fragments. And it dates to an early Iron Age cemetery in it's approximately 800 to 500 BCE. So that's, you know, 2500, 2800 ish yeah. years ago. Pretty long time. Yeah. Um, it's located in Hallstatt, Austria, and Hallstatt is an area that is known for salt production, and that is all the way back into prehistoric times. It's an area that has been known and used for that for a really, really long time. So it makes sense that they have this large occupation in this area. Man, I'd like to know more about salt production, to be honest with you. I know. Austria? <coughs> Austria's got like a lot of mountains and stuff. Yeah. I know it's not all mountainous, but it does definitely has a lot of mountains. Mm -hmm. And I always think of salt production as like a coastal thing. Well, kind of, if you're looking at it from like a saltwater standpoint, mm -hmm. but also like the salt flats in Nevada oh, and true. Yeah. Um, Utah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, this, just the, the accumulation of uh, salty water and then drying up and then, you know, mm -hmm. water and then drying up and then just you get these layers of salt mm -hmm. that people actually use for salt. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I honestly didn't 
look into why it was or how, what geologically made it mm-hmm. an area that was used for salt production. But that is what this article said. So and by the way, this article is from a publication called Archeo News and that's Archeo with a K. And I couldn't find out quite too much about this publication, except it seems that it originates in Turkey because it seems mm. like Turkey is their main focus. Yeah. But uh, it's some pretty well written articles and everything looks very archaeology focused and a really cool website. So definitely a, a neat place to click around and just, you know, learn about this kind of stuff. So I saw that this site um, contained over a thousand graves and, and uh, lots of grave goods. And yep. It was discovered in 1863. Yeah. Why are they talking about it now? Yeah, so this site was like really excavated in the the 1800s. Like they they basically, I mean, I don't want to say that they were grave robbers back then, <laughs> but they definitely cared a lot more about the artifacts and the grave goods. Yeah. And not as much about the burials, especially cuz these were mostly cremation burials, which means they didn't have a whole lot of bones associated yeah. with them anyway. So, back in the day, like the gentleman archaeologists, they really we were just more interested in the artifacts and and they did find a thousand graves over a thousand graves but they didn't really record much about the grave shape or the construction or any of the other things that you might be interested in noting from an archaeological standpoint or context standpoint about these graves well this is 1863 the science of you know accurate stratigraphy and recording and archaeology didn't really start to i mean come into play until really the late 1800s yeah and then and then started picking up in the 1900s but even then there was definitely people still doing things the old way yeah and it was an archaeology of things back then rather than an archaeology of people it was i don't even know that i fault them for it that much because it was a brand new science at the time and they they just hadn't quite figured out how to connect the things that they were finding with the people that put them there who they were why they did it and like create that bigger picture that archaeologists are interested in creating today so fortunately they missed some of the burials which is why (laughs) the scientists today are going back to this area and they're using new technology modern technology to find the graves that they missed basically yeah and this one in particular that they're talking about is particularly well preserved so they got really lucky that it was missed the first time around and they're also doubly lucky that it happens to be very very well preserved Mm -hmm. There were there are several pieces of bronze jewelry, including a ribbed arm ring, which is the feature photo in the article. Definitely check it out. It looks really cool. Like it's not like when you hear ribbed arm ring. I don't know what is in your head Im- immediately, but this looks almost more like like a like a shell kind of. Yeah, you know, it's it it's really cool looking. So there's that, and then there's also several wire discs that yeah. are pretty thin. There's a blade with traces of a wooden handle and a belt fitting, among other things. There's a picture of a bronze spiral. That's the disc. That's yeah. the disc. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious about that because, I mean, this looks like a spring. It a does. Coil, a coiled spring. Yes. It actually, yeah, it does. Well, we'll get to that in a second because that is kind of the interesting thing here. Yeah. So everything was densely packed in the grave and there's also bone remnants in there too. You can actually see like the end of a long bone in the picture that there's like a picture of all the goods packed in together and Mm -hmm. it kind of looks like a humerus to me, but I don't think it's human and it's hard to tell in the picture. It's probably not human though. Um, It's no laughing matter, that's for sure. (laughs) Oh my gosh, you're terrible. (laughs) But there were animal bones in the grave, so it, it could be that this is an animal long bone. And I mean, it's a cremation grave. So like there's probably not that much left of the actual like person that was buried here. So it probably is animal. But okay, so once they separated out all these artifacts and started studying them individually, these spiral discs that you noted looks a little bit like a spring. What they found is that there are traces of textile Hmm. on the underside of it, like stuck to it. And this is an interesting conclusion that they've come to and i would love to see more evidence about this but the researchers say that this is the first evidence that the cremated remains were placed in a textile pouch for burial wait a minute so they burned so, the bodies and then took the remains and put and them in a pouch yes how yeah. did they separate the bodies from whatever they burned oh them i'm in? sure it's lots and lots of ash from whatever they burned yeah, it into right? i mean that's how big pouch well that's kind of how cremated remains are today too right like well, you get some whatever is in there to burn it is also part of it well no because they use like gas 
So oh, you're, you're yeah, in a sterile true. chamber, and probably the only other thing that's in there is other people's ashes. Yeah. You know, I don't know how well they clean them out, just from a ethical yeah. standpoint. But right. I'm guessing pretty well is what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And uh, unless we're talking like a, you know, a New Orleans burial box where you know, <laughs> they fall you on top of each other. On top of each other. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know, but th- so. What they're saying is because this fabric was found on the underside of the spiral, that the spirals were placed on top of this pouch, this textile Mm. pouch that would have contained the remains. And one thing that was unclear to me was were the grave goods inside this textile pouch with the remains or were they just around the pouch? There's not as much information about about that. So I don't know for sure. But but anyway, well, and also the other thing that could have happened is the spiral could have settled to the bottom of the pouch or maybe the spirals were put into the pouch first yeah. and the remains were put in after that. So I guess setting it on top of the pouch, they probably think that because of the way that they're arranged in the grave, mm-hmm. they've got some stratigraphy saying that it's hard to say, though. It sounds like there needs to be more studies and more grace found like this for them to really get a good idea of how these different pieces were used. But I'll tell yeah. you one thing people need to do is they need to have better scales in their photos because <laughs> yeah. the scale in this photo says 10 centimeters on one of the squares. And uh-huh. I'm like, is that square 10 centimeters and this whole thing's a meter? Oh. Or is that saying the entire scale is 10 centimeters? Well, the entire the entire thing, because there's that armband there. So given that context... Yeah. Because the armband would be pretty small, so it's probably... Well, I'm just seeing the... I'm just looking at the spiral here, though. Yeah. Yeah, by itself. Oh, I see. Okay, I was looking at the one below yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. So, that is kind of confusing, actually. I mean, I'm pretty sure that that means the whole scale is 10 centimeters. Yeah, I think so. But the simple fact that I'm questioning it means do better. <laughs> so... Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's, yeah, about 10 centimeters would be about right to be kind of like a weight to put on top of something if yeah. if it's some kind of, like holding it down part of the ritual of the burial or something like that well, and if it if it really is kind of a well it's a spiral i mean and it's all coiled on itself mm-hmm. so maybe that was the the act of burying it did that or something like that because i was thinking if it were in some kind of pouch you could actually shove the fabric up through the middle of it and the spiral could use be used as like a closure to oh just like, it could totally yeah. but yeah. that wouldn't have brought itself back to this shape um, after time, no, I it wouldn't. wouldn't think. No, it wouldn't. So have. it went in like that. It could have been like a napkin holder, though. You know, where it's got a, yeah. a thing on top of it, and then there's a ring on the backside that it passes through. But sure, but it clearly went in like this. Because, yeah. like I said, if it were spread, if it were stretched out at all, yeah, it wouldn't have gone back to this shape as things disintegrated around yeah. it. Yeah, and they definitely found the fabric on the backside of it. Like it was either set on top of it or it was inside it, and it settled mm-hmm. onto the fabric itself. Yeah. Either way, that spiral settling on top of the textile is what preserved it so that they can now do more research on that and what the fabric was like from you know 2500 mm-hmm. years ago so that'll be something that should come out in the future because they they just found that there was fabric attached to it they haven't studied it further so oh, man yeah. we need to take a break because i'm really thirsty do you have another bullet point <laughs> wow okay so really quick <laughs> The um, animal bones and some of the metal objects, too, they appear to be purposely broken as if they were um, a ritual offering, Ah. perhaps. (laughs) Come on, it's a burial. you got to have rituals with burial. I guess. I'll give you that one. (laughs) (laughs) And so anyway, all of this together, we've got, you know, potential cremation, cremation in a bag with the spirals on top and then these broken bones and metal objects around it all of it together they're saying represents a new iron age burial practice that is distinctive to the hallstatt culture to the hallstatt culture which is in this salt production region so yeah yeah. i think all that does seem pretty good evidence of it and hopefully they'll find more burials like this to really you know solidify that idea because i think it is still it's so hard to like come up with a whole thing off of one burial you know (laughs) but This could just be the initial release or just a press release. Like, oh, those are some pretty good photos. They do seem pretty museum quality there. But yeah, they definitely clean that up a little bit. Yeah. All right. Well, that's pretty cool. Now Mm -hmm. we're going to go from there over to basically our own backyard, geographically Mm -hmm. speaking, and talk about some of the uh, oldest human occupied sites in North America and the site that just really the area, I guess I should say, that just keeps on giving Mm -hmm. back in a minute. Welcome back to the archaeology show. (laughs) (laughs) 
Welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 226, segment three. That's right. Mm-hmm. So we are going to go over to Oregon, like we said, and we're in Oregon, yes. but this is in Eastern Oregon, mm-hmm. over in the high desert part of Oregon that looks a lot like Nevada. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. I So this... Um, This site is in Riley, Oregon, and I was like, I've never even heard of Riley, Oregon. So I had to look it up on the map, and it's literally like as center of central Oregon as you can get. And it it's I think there was like an archery and store, and that was like the the town. Like that was it. That's it. Yeah, Yeah. sounds good. Very small place. Yeah, this place that we're going to talk about is called Rimrock Draw Rock Shelter, and. The the landscape, if you just look at the picture, again, it looks just like Nevada. There's sagebrush, yeah. there's rocks, you know, volcanic rock, mm-hmm. and uh, just a real high desert type of environment like we're used to seeing in Nevada and even parts of um, Utah and Idaho, that whole area. Mm-hmm. You know, that's still considered, I think, part of the Great Basin, but I don't know if it's part of the basin itself. Yeah, going it up might be. to Oregon. I'm, yeah. It does extend Honestly, into Oregon remember. a little bit, I think. Yeah, it but, definitely does. Yeah. But I don't know if it extends all the way up to here. Yeah, so. yeah. But, but the it, environment's the same. In in checking out the picture too, it's I mean, I found a couple of rock shelters in my time doing archaeology in Nevada and they're mm-hmm. usually like on the, on steep like hillsides, right? Yeah. And this is doesn't I don't know if it's perspective or what, but it does not look very steep. It looks like it's sort of this unassuming little like rock outcrop on a right. sort of gently un- undulating landscape. It's just not where I would expect a rock shelter of such significance to be, I guess is what I'm getting at here. Mm-hmm. It's kind of crazy that it, it is. Yeah, this was actually a uh, field school being run by the University of Oregon, being run by the University of Oregon's Museum of Natural and Cultural History. And they've been doing it there since 2011 in partnership with the BLM because it's mm-hmm. on BLM land. And the person who's kind of running this thing, Patrick O'Grady, actually, I don't think I've ever actually met him, mm-hmm. but I know him through the Internet. Like we're yeah. friends on Facebook and stuff. So right. I messaged him and there's a good chance we're going to try to set up an interview for yeah. later when they're actually at their field school now. Yeah. He's like, um, can we do this in a few weeks when I get out <laughs> yeah. of field school? I'm like, yeah. yeah, dude, calm down. Yeah. And it's it's really cool, too, that he's ready to talk about it. And we'll get yeah. to why in a minute. But there's it's it's been a very slow process because they're very meticulous with the oh, yeah. the science of this site and they don't want to jump ahead of anything or release anything before they're ready to. So this this release that we're talking about right now is like the culmination of more than 10 mm-hmm. years of work that they've been doing on the site. So it's it's really cool. Yeah. So in the first couple of years, the a tooth enamel fragment from an extinct camel species was found buried under a layer of volcanic ash that they knew was from a Mount St. Helens eruption. Pause. Uh-huh. Camels in the in North America. Right. You know how I know that there are camels here or there were? Because we literally saw <laughs> camels in Pacific City just the we other did. day. We were just like sitting in a coffee shop and all of a sudden some camels were like walking down the street. And we're like, what is going on? This place is so weird. <laughs> yeah, apparently they didn't have anything on them. Like they were just camels. People no. were walking them. Yeah. But the second time we saw them, they were walking back from the beach and they were decked out with like I don't know. I'm going to just say like Bedouin like, style Like saddles. Middle Eastern yeah. like riding saddles. Yeah. yeah. And there's a sand dune that <laughs> out that way that you can hike on. So I'm sure that they were doing something with the right. sand dune. Probably some cultural yeah. appropriation, whatever. You just have to but go with it. <laughs> the cool thing is camels like horses used to be here. There yeah. was a kind of horse here. There was camels here. Mm-hmm. All kinds of stuff. And they those all slots. died out. Yeah. For various reasons that, w- that are a whole other episode and series on its own. Yeah. But they were the we brought horses back. You yeah, know, the Spanish, I think, did. Yeah. And, and then uh, we just never brought camels back for whatever reason. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it's most of this country is not really has, hospitable uh, to camels, I don't okay. think. Um, yeah, they probably find. I mean, they're designed to like, you know, live in desert environments, mm-hmm. but I'm sure they'd be like, hey, there's an abundance of water here. I don't have to store it all. <laughs> right. So, you know. Yeah. Anyway, one of the cool things, like you said, under the volcanic <laughs> ash, I just love volcanic ash. Yeah. Because it when is I worked, so dateable, right? Well, yeah. And when I worked in, well, worked, I did a field school in Africa that I've mm-hmm. talked about before. That was the only way we were able to date stuff is because you have the the basalt layers and mm-hmm. you use potassium argon dating, which is the decay of potassium atoms into argon, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know that that decay rate and blah, 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 you can, you can date those mm-hmm. layers. Well... I'm not sure what method they're using to date the ash here. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be something similar, although it's not quite old enough to use yeah, potassium argon dating. It's um, much newer. Yeah. yeah. Potassium argon is like 
on the scale of hundreds of thousands of yeah. years, right? So, but this was dated to about 15,000 years mm -hmm. ago, which means the fragments of the camel tooth mammal were at least that old. That's how, that's how that kind of dating works. It's yeah. relative dating. Yeah. If we found another layer below that, that we could date, we could say, well, it's between these two. Mm -hmm. And if we can look at the stratigraphy and say, well, it looks relatively undisturbed. Mm -hmm. We might even start to get to say like where within that range mm -hmm. it is if we get more confident. Yeah. Like, like when you have a really solid date, you usually have a combination of some kind of, you know, chemical dating or not chemical. Yeah. Is chemical the right word? Nah. Like dating, like carbon dating or something like that. Yeah, you have yeah. that combined with relative dating. That's because, radiometric dating. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm smart. Anyway, <laughs> so you have the combination of those two different types of dating, and that's what gives you like a really solid date. Yeah. So on this site, they already knew that this camel enamel camel tooth enamel was camel older enamel. camel enamel was <laughs> older than 15,000 years ago because of this volcanic ash but they were able to also radiocarbon date the camel fragments so camel fragments that's a bad note on my part is that <laughs> fragments of camel i mean i guess it is it is camel, but it is camel enamel fragments you're not wrong yeah, not, i guess not <laughs> they are canamel fragments <laughs> oh my god <laughs> We're not even drinking yet. No. Anyway, so they did send those send those out to be radiocarbon dated, and it came. They came back with a date of eighteen thousand two hundred fifty years old, and that was in two thousand eighteen. And so I, great. <laughs> I love that because there are haters out there that are just like, oh, carbon dating is flawed. But like we dated through independent methods, the ash to fifteen thousand mm -hmm. years. We yeah. know that that's true. Yeah independently dated then and then you get a correlating date that's before that because it was under the ash that's older yeah that's the that's it's it's the perfect. Law of superposition it, it is like the perfect combination of relative and carbon dating oh it's perfect <laughs> but but these guys out of an abundance of caution didn't want to just take that for granted because you know radiocarbon dating does have its issues so we'll get to that in a second but they do have a reason to send it out for more dating at some point so so underneath this camel tooth they found orange agate tools that were unquestionably made by humans that's cool and that are apparently splattered with blood residue from extinct mammals and you know what runs those mammals Camels. Camels. <laughs> Those poor bastards. <laughs> so do you think they were murdering camels with their I think this was agate a, tools? A camel murder <laughs> it's a site. Camel murder site. <laughs> maybe maybe uh, the guy that you know can shed some light on that for us. Yes, maybe. <laughs> Mr. O'Grady. I'm sure, I'm sure Dr. O'Grady. Dr. O'Grady, yes. Yeah. yeah. So so here so let's just like recap here. We've got volcanic ash <laughs> at fifteen thousand years. Then we've got below that at eighteen thousand two hundred and fifty years, we have the camel enamel. And then below that, we have these tools that are unquestionably made by humans that also have blood splatter on them. So that is really cool and really great. There are no photos of the tools in the article. And so there's no more information about how they know for sure that they are human made tools or how they know that there's blood residue on them. This is just a press release. It's just an initial discovery situation. So they're not yet releasing information about the tools themselves, just that they exist. So, yeah, I mean, this is really yeah. just a press release. Yeah, which so. I'm, I'm completely okay with, but I am super interested to hear what the rest of the academic community has to say about the tools. Because as you know, with some of these really old sites, the problem that comes in is when the tools are are a little bit suspect, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying these tools are like that at all. I am 100% not saying that. Right. I haven't seen the tools. I don't know anything about the tools. But I will be very interested in the opinion of the rest of the academic community when the tool analysis does come in. So, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually looking at uh, Dr. O'Grady's Facebook page right now. Oh, okay. And <laughs> he's got some pretty cool stuff showing the some of the camel fragments. Oh, and uh, he, actually, one of the agate scrapers is on there. Okay. How does it yeah, look? Yeah. And I'll, I'll show Rachel, but you guys can't see it. Oh, yeah, hey, that's that looks... definitely a scraper. Oh, yeah. That is like... Here, I'll do some really bad YouTubing right now for the YouTube audience. <laughs> Anyway, um, and that's and that's shared from a page, so it looks like you can go to oh, the yeah. page Good and call. look at it yourself. That we, is the Museum of Natural and Cultural History, so go yeah, check that we'll out on Facebook. Grab that link and we'll put it in the notes so that we yeah. can share it too. Yeah, but we'll yeah, that is pretty unquestionably yeah, uh, made by human tool. That you're not going to argue with that for no, sure. No, I don't that's think. definitely a scraper. Yeah, that's yeah. so that's really cool. That is makes me even more excited about the conclusion. Yeah. So these guys out of an abundance of caution of course they were really really 
interested in having two dates to confirm the camel dating, the camel tooth date, Mm -hmm. because that's the clincher here, right? Like they know the volcanic ash is 15,000 years, but they, if they can't get that camel date to be good, then all they can say about these tools is that they're older than 15,000 years. Yeah. But that camel date is good at 18,250. Then they can say the tools are at least 18,250 years old, which makes it crazy old right i mean for human stuff just being pre-15,000 years oh, sure. there's very few sites yes, that are dating to that old but there are more and more right so it, when true. you go back past that that's where you're starting yeah. to get into like the oldest sites yeah so anyway so what they did is they sent that camel tooth the same tooth a piece of the same tooth out for testing again and the results recently came back which is why this publication or this press mm-hmm. release is coming out now but the recent the results recently came back and they're just like a smidge older than what that initial date said so it's, it's like still in the range. yes confirmation yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah so when you have two dates saying the same thing then you can really start to trust it at that point plus all the relative dating as well what that means is that we are talking about one of the oldest sites in Western North America. So, yeah. yeah. And these areas that we're talking about, this high desert environment is just so dry and has been dry for mm-hmm. a really long time. I mean, it probably wasn't as dry back in the day when we're talking about mm-hmm. here, because that was the end of the ice age. Yeah. There was still lakes around. Yep. Paleo Lake Lahontan was pretty much taking up the whole area. Yes, this true. is probably beachfront property, <laughs> <laughs> if I had to guess. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, totally. You know, anytime you see little undulations and stuff, if there's a high spot that could have been an island, it Mm -hmm. could have been, you know, just an an outcropping of land or something or a peninsula. But either way, um, in Idaho, not too far away, actually, um, is Cooper's Ferry, which is another very, very famous Mm -hmm. um, uh, paleo uh, human site. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, dates to around uh, more than 16,000 years. Yeah. So and this would push that back. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy that they're going to be able to push back the some you know the oldest known occupation for mm-hmm. sure occupation in this part of the world in, in this part yeah. of north america to by more than two thousand years it's yeah. great and the thing that i know i've said before if you've got people here that are just like yeah what's up camels we know how to take you down <laughs> or they're riding them they weren't riding them but you know i like to think that <laughs> camels seem like they're pretty chill i'd be like you know you probably could have ridden them yeah maybe but, uh, do they, they do spit. unless they spit like alpacas do yeah well according to aladdin um, camels, <laughs> camels do actually do, spit. Oh, well, you should yeah. get all of your knowledge of Middle Eastern yes, mammals Disney. from Disney and yeah. Aladdin specifically. That's yeah. a great plan. Yeah. No, well, everything wrong with I know that. from about mermaids comes from that and the Netflix documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my God. Anyway, uh, so the, the, anyway, the, the point is, if these people are established, they're living in a cave or a rock shelter and they're just like making tools, which mm-hmm. means they knew where to get that material. They're not tourists. No, they didn't come no. here just to do that. Yeah. Even if they even if they did something wacky, like arrived onto the Oregon coast in a boat. Right. Which we know they didn't. We know unless that they that came happen. down the shoreline, um, you know, yeah. which is another theory. Yeah. But, but still, that would have taken forever. But yeah. unless they just showed up in a sailboat and then walked to the high desert. These guys have to have been here for hundreds of years. Yeah. If not thousands. Yeah. They More didn't, than likely they thousands. They didn't just show up with that technology knowing what to do. No. They, and it, yeah. And it couldn't have been this generation either. Mm-hmm. You know, even if it was a relatively recent arrival, let's say these are the first Americans, mm-hmm. you know, so, so to speak, <laughs> um, the first Native Americans, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they're, they're actually Russian, if that's the case. So, <laughs> right. you know, or Asian in some way. Yeah. And, uh, and even even then, just if you came down through the the, the Bering um, the Bering Land Bridge mm-hmm. and, and through the Ice Free Corridor, if that was your route, yeah. or you came down and followed, you know, kelp flows or something like that on your little raft coming down around Canada and, and Alaska, mm-hmm. there, it would have taken decades. I mean, just decades, mm-hmm. unless you had a mission and you were going somewhere, but they wouldn't have. There wouldn't have a reason for there that. There would have been no way that they would have known where they were going. They were just yeah. following game, following water, following some kind of resource. Yeah. Maybe just better weather, honestly. <laughs> like, who knows? Yeah. But yeah, that's that's how that happened. And that's why it's so important. Like, yeah, it's really great that this is a super old site in Western North America. Mm-hmm. But it's so much more important to look at it in context with all of the old sites in North yeah. America. Because up in Alaska and Canada, too, I think there are sites that are older than this one. And what that right. is showing is that progression, like you're talking of people coming down, you know, crossing over from Asia, from, you know, the Russia area into Alaska and then down through Canada and into North into the rest of North America. And that 
that context of all of those old sites together and seeing like, oh, this one up here is the oldest and then they mm-hmm. get newer as you move down. That that bigger picture is what is really important for creating the image of how like the North America was peopled, essentially. Yeah. So finding sites like this is just going to help you know add more to that picture as we go it's really great and good science too not just like (laughs) jumping to conclusions and saying oh i found an old thing and i think it's old you know like these guys have done such good science from what this press release you know says so far and yeah it's not peer-reviewed yet but i have a feeling that it is really going to stand up to that once it is ready to be published i have no doubt yeah well i mean the stuff they've published up to this point has been exceptional so yes yeah it's really great all right. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Hopefully we can get Dr. O'Grady on and you can get some uh, firsthand uh, quotes from the field season before they even publish anything. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You know, maybe even before they put out some more press releases. Yep. So, well, that press release actually came out from the uh, BLM, I believe. Oh, yeah. And okay. they're, they're all hot mm-hmm. on, you know, hey, look what we're doing with your public mm-hmm. funds and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, so. and I don't think we mentioned where this article is from. Oh, yeah. This is the <laughs> our, Idaho Statesman podcast. Our favorite podcast. coming in hot. <laughs> Idaho <laughs> Statesman. I feel like we need to, like, find whoever's in charge of their their cultural articles because they do such a great job of covering all this stuff it's awesome yeah all right well thanks everybody and we will be back next week bye thanks for listening to the archaeology show feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.arcpodnet.com find us on facebook instagram and twitter at arcpodnet music for this show is called i wish you would look from the band sea hero again Thanks for listening and have an awesome day.